so far for the last two days, we've really focused on talking about flow. Um, but as hydraulic engineers, you know, what we're really interested in is what? It's stage. <laughs> you know, we, we want to know like how high the water is going to get and like, you know, the probability that it's going to get that high because that's what we can picture when we look at a flood as things that are flooded. You, know, you can't typically look at a river and be like, oh, it's definitely at 10,000 CFS now, but yesterday it was at 14,000 CFS. You know, you think of everything in terms of feet above some datum. So we're going to talk about transforming your flow data to stage data. So we'll talk about methods for transforming flow data to stage data for levees and also for dams because they differ a little bit. Uh, primarily in that for levees, we typically look at flow for the peak instantaneous condition because we want to look at what happens at that maximal peak flow if that would overtop the levee. You know, but for dams, they have storage upstream, so it usually takes a certain amount of time to fill them up, so we have to kind of consider a critical duration. Um, and in risk assessments, we use RMC RFA for dams. Uh, and for levees, we've got a variety of other different techniques that we'll talk about. So first, let's discuss using flow frequency to inform estimates of stage frequencies. So you know, why do we bother with the flow frequency analysis if we have observed stage data? Uh, well, that's because stage data, typically you can't fit a distribution to it um, because of the geometry of the site and other factors. You can't just take like, you know, 100 years of stage data and fit an LP3 distribution. You'll get a weird shape and you won't get an accurate estimate. Versus flows, which are generated from random stochastic processes in nature, uh, we can fit a distribution to those. That's why we start by doing flow frequency analysis and then transfer into stage frequency analysis. So <clears throat> we'll discuss using stage discharge rating curves at gauges, um, using hydraulic models, looking at whether you have existing gauge rating curves, um, all to estimate the annual exceedance probability associated with given elevation or stage. So this example shows a flow frequency curve in pink uh, based on 100 years of data. So this is the unregulated uh, peak flow frequency curve for a levee site or for a gauge. The curve on the right is the stage discharge rating curve uh, that ranges up to about 32 feet in a discharge of 400,000 CFS. Uh, and we're using that rating curve to translate the best estimate for the flow frequency curve from the flow frequency curve to the stage frequency curve. So for example, at the 0.5 AEP frequency, the flow is around 30,000 CFS. So the stage discharge rating curve, uh, 30,000 CFS corresponds to a stage of approximately 18 feet. So that value of 18 feet is then plotted at the same annual exceedance probability associated with that flow. So the 0.5 AEP. So we're assuming somewhat of a one-to-one -one relationship using the rating curve as a transform here. And we can plot that as one of the points on our stage frequency curve. So we'll do this for a range of flows from the flow frequency curve until we end up with that blue curve, which is an estimate of how the annual exceedance probability associated with a given stage. Uh, just note that the stage frequency curve can't extend less frequently than the rating curve, which is just above a stage of 30 feet. So this is an example of a rating curve. The USGS maintains rating curves for almost all of their flow gauges. I found a handful where they don't have published rating curves, even though they have published flow data. Uh, but they typically generate these rating curves uh, based on observed measurements of flow during high events, moderate events, and low events at the site, uh, as well as some other survey techniques. So you have to use caution when interpreting some of this data. So stages can be sensitive to changes in the river channel or floodway. Um, I know I've worked on a project that had a sand bed. It was subject to aggradation and degradation depending on the different flow regimes. So the rating curve was constantly shifting over time. So when you plotted the observed stage flow measurements, it looked really ugly compared to the rating curve that the USGS said to adopt to that site. And it actually brought up a lot of questions for a site. So just something to pay attention to. So whenever possible, you want to estimate the peak flow frequency curve and convert to stage frequency using whatever the currently adopted rating curve is. Because like the USGS for their gauge sites, they actually will send technicians out 
periodically monitor and measure monitor their measurements and the bed to correct their rating curves and update them when they're able to. Uh, just note this isn't always feasible when you have complex systems like backwater and tidal influences, especially in this part of the country. So using a rating curve like this one would work great for transferring a portion of the flow frequency curve for the observed flows. Uh, but what happens, because we're looking at much higher events sometimes, and you need to go past the rating curve. So how do you get that information? Well, the answer is a hydraulic model. So you need to pair up with a gifted hydraulic modeler, and you need to run some really large flows through a good model so that you can extrapolate your rating curve. Hydraulic models are also useful to develop rating curve sets at multiple locations along a levee or levee system. Uh, they can also be used to develop the flow frequency profiles along a levee. And this example shows flow profiles for multiple annual exceedance probabilities from about the one in two year to the one in 500 year events. And diagrams like this are especially helpful because if you're doing a levee screening or levee risk assessment, you know, basically the top of this levee uh, is in RAS, this great lateral structure. And so you can kind of identify, you know, where incipient overtopping would occur on the levee and approximately what annual chance exceedance or annual exceedance probability would be. So these plots are really, really helpful for risk assessments for people who actually need to like interpret this information and make decisions uh, because it helps them to identify kind of key levy control locations, incipient overtopping locations. <laughs> I didn't make it. <laughs> Those two did. <laughs> but do you recognize it? Does that look like, uh, I was going to say, <laughs> American River? So. Uh, Oftentimes, the observed empirical plotting positions uh, are plotted with the stage frequency curve calculated from the flow frequency and rain curves for comparison and calibration. And so what's shown here is just, in this case, the observed maximum stages for a specific location and viable plotting positions, which we talked about on day one. So this slide presents a final stage frequency curve, including uncertainty. It was produced by evaluating flow frequency curves and using hydraulic modeling to model the peak elevations at a particular station along a levee for a range of different annual exceedance probabilities. Uh, the modeled relationship between flow and stage was used to convert the flow frequency curves to the stage frequency curves. So picking points of flow on your flow frequency curve going to your rating curve and then plotting that as your stage frequency curve, but also using the uncertainty bounds in this case and the expected value. So we're gonna talk for a moment about a new RMC software package that can be very helpful if you're doing a risk assessment for a levy or if you need to develop a stage frequency with uncertainty. Uh, that package is called RMC Total Risk. It's Currently in beta version, uh, awaiting its final approval and review. Uh, but RMC Total Risk is, is going to do a lot of, it has a lot of the functionality of at risk if you've used that before for calculating your overall risk for a system. So Total Risk can perform, uh, risk is, it can be used to estimate risk for dams or levees or complex systems. So you can look at multiple dams in series or parallel and estimate overall total risk. Uh, it's capable of running full Monte Carlo analysis, simulating uncertainty within every input in the model, uh, with run times on the orders of seconds to minutes. Anytime I've played around with this and tried to run it, I can get an answer typically in less than 30 seconds with uncertainty. So for this presentation, we'll focus specifically on its capabilities to use flow frequency inputs to produce a stage frequency curve with uncertainty and how that can be used to help inform recommendations for uh, accreditation and the National Flood Insurance Program. So RMC Total Risk is a, another software package built by Hayden Smith, by the way. So if you have questions, you can reach out to him. <laughs> so first is you launch the program um, and you can define a hazard. So in most cases, our hazard is the flow frequency curve is what we can put into Total Risk. If you have a, already developed the stage frequency curve, you could input that in there as well. But if you haven't, total risk is a tool to get the stage frequency curve with uncertainty. So you can create a hazard, which is your flow frequency curve with uncertainty bounds and total risk. And then you can also add a transform. 
And RMC total risk has a number of different transform functions that you can put in there. But essentially, the transform function can be your rating curve. Uh, so at whatever your levy control location is, or maybe where you have incipient overtopping, you can hook this up to your hazard, and total risk will incorporate the uncertainty in your flow frequency analysis with your stage frequency curve uh, and to come up with an estimate of what your overall, or sorry, rating curve to come up with an overall estimate in stage frequency for your site. So this just summarizes a couple of different transform options that you have. Uh, and some guidance in EM 1110.2-1619 on how to incorporate uncertainty in your rating curve, because we always plot the rating curves as one-to-one, -one, but if you ever plot the measured data with it, you know that there's just a tremendous amount of uncertainty in those rating curves. And so total risk will allow you to, to incorporate the uncertainty from both of those sources into a final estimate of stage frequency. So in total risk, if you set up uh, your input hazard uh, transform from flow to stage or stage to flow, depending on what you want to do. Uh, all you need to do is add some dummy consequences. They don't have to be real. You can basically just put like zero to one in some kind of dollar amount or life loss estimate because it doesn't use it to come up with the stage frequency curve. It just needs it to run the analysis. And then you can set up an analysis in total risk. And this is one of the results that it'll plot. So. This is actually a stage frequency curve for a particular location based on our input flow frequency with uncertainty, as well as our rating curve with uncertainty. And so this could be a really helpful tool for estimating, you know, what is the actual stage frequency associated with the 1% event, for example. So um, to avoid paying for flood insurance in the United States, if you're within the 1% or base flood elevation, you have to have your levy or whatever your flood protection system is accredited by the FEMA, FEMA's National Flood Insurance Program, or NFIP. Uh, total risk can produce <coughs> estimates of the overall risk. Um, essentially, wait, did we miss a slide? No. Yeah, so for accreditation purposes, um, we're currently following the guidance that if your overall risk is less than about e to the minus three, then we recommend you accredit and no assurance estimate is needed. If it's, if it's greater than e to the minus two, then we don't recommend accreditation. And if your annual exceedance probability or risk is between e to the minus two and e to the minus three, we have to perform an assurance estimate. And assurance is some additional analysis needed to inform whether or not we can recommend the levy for accreditation. Um, but basically this involves at least, yeah, in most cases like an SQRA or QRA, QRA level of effort to estimate what the actual assurance should be that the levy would be able to contain the 1% event. Um, I don't have that image up here, but for the assurance estimate, um, if you have to go that route because you fall into an inconclusive zone with regards to your risk, uh, basically if you compute 65% or less assurance, then the recommendation would be don't accredit that levy system. If your assurance is greater than 85%, the recommendation would be you can accredit that levy system. But then if the assurance falls between 65% and 85%, uh, the recommendation would be maybe additional analysis is required or professional judgment. And the nice thing about total risk is if you do set up a risk analysis for a levy system, uh, like we described, it'll actually give you a plot and an estimate of assurance to help support those NFIP recommendations. So if you're doing risk assessment on a levy system, uh, using total risk is really valuable because you can get these if you need to do an assurance calculation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think previously, I know you two know a lot more about at risk. Previously, you could get assurance estimates through at risk, couldn't you? What was that? Okay, yeah, Zach says you had to do a different method in at risk to kind of back out what the assurance estimate should be. But in total risk, it's a direct computation with a plot that says, okay, here you are. <laughs> Oh, got it. Yeah. <laughs> I think the that's a good answer. So Derek had said, we, we can use total risk, but it's still in beta, so it, it hasn't been officially adopted. Um, 
but it has gone through a few levels of review. And I mean, I, I would encourage you if you haven't to, you can download it from the RMC's website and start getting familiar with it just because it's a really great product. Um, but yeah, if you're actually going to be making decisions, you might want to verify with your vertical chain whether or not you should be using at risk or total risk to come up with your assurance estimates. Uh, now we're going to talk about transferring flow to stage for dams. So dams, obviously, you know, the, difference, the main difference between dams and levees with why we look at peak stage versus um, the approach we're about to talk about is like, there's not a lot of storage in the channel for levee. So it's that instantaneous peak flow that we're concerned about for overtopping a levee versus dam. We have a giant bathtub upstream that we need to fill up before, you know, we can actually get a stage. So typically, as well as an RMC RFA, use a hydrologic reservoir routing method, which is based on the continuity equation, uh, which is essentially inflow minus outflow equals change in storage to the dam. So in RMC RFA, you input an elevation, storage, outflow relationship, and then you have a randomly sampled inflow to your reservoir, and it performs the routing for you to come up with an estimated stage. Uh, and this slide here just shows an example of the continuity equation, but this is all you need to know is this is the, the crux of what RFA is trying to do to come up with the stage. Just look at whatever inflow you have coming in, how much space that takes up, and then whatever your resulting stage is. So important factors for reservoir routing include the inflow volume, the timing, which is, which is defined with an inflow hydrograph, the reservoir outflow, which include not only outflow capacity, but also reservoir operations. <laughs> like how fast and when the spillway gates are opened. Um, also, the available reservoir storage is important, which is often defined using that elevation storage relationship that I just talked about. So the available storage also takes into account the antecedent condition or initial starting pool. The higher the reservoir and the less available storage. Uh, an AEP neutral approach would be to use the most common or 50% exceedance duration reservoir pool as the starting pool for routing. However, better techniques for choosing a starting pool and all the items discussed for reservoir routing will be discussed and seen in your next lectures. So like in RMC RFA, you know, it's randomly sampling a starting stage when it's doing its stochastic runs. And it's doing that many thousands of times to come up with this overall estimate of uncertainty. So some items to note for reservoir routing are that peak stage always occurs when the inflow crosses the outflow, right? That makes sense. If inflow is greater than outflow, your pool has to rise. Uh, to conserve mass. <laughs> but as soon as your outflow is greater than your inflow, your pool should trust and it should start dropping. So that's just what the slide here shows is that in green is our pool elevation, blue is our inflow hydrograph, and red is our outflow. And right when this crosses, that's where we should see a crest. So presented here is a final dam stage frequency curve, also called a hydrologic loading curve or a hazard curve for dam. So this was produced by completing an inflow volume frequency analysis, using that as an input to a reservoir routing frequency analysis, in this case, RMC RFA. Uh, multiple inputs are stochastically sampled. You know, you'll get a chance to see that in one of the workshops later today. Uh, some of the parameters, some of the inputs that are randomly sampled are the inflow volume frequency curve, uh, starting hydrograph shape, starting pool elevation, uh, et cetera. These are then routed through the reservoir using a simple reservoir model of stage, storage, and discharge to represent reservoir operations and how we would expect the reservoir to behave for a range of different flow events. Uh, note that the observed plotting positions are on the plot, which are used to define the more frequent end of the curve and help calibrate the stochastic reservoir routing model. So it's a good sanity check that, you know, even though we're really interested in this upper end of the curve, if we can't match the lower end of the curve, that's a, a problem. And so you have to go through and kind of come up with a, a reasonable and defensible relationship to hit what you've seen in the past to help improve our understanding of how the reservoir is operated and our confidence and our estimates for, you know, top of dam in this case is out near E to the minus six. Here's a check on learning. Critical loading for levees are driven by blank flows, while critical loading for dams are driven by blank flows. So just to recap, um, we discussed 
the whole point of this lecture was talking about for dams and levees, how do we transform flow stage, which we, how do we transform flow stage, or sorry, flow into stage um, that we actually use for some of our risk estimates and what we're ultimately interested in, which is the annual exceedance probability for a given stage. So we discussed a few different methods you can use for levies, including new tools and total risk, which are really helpful and can give you an actual accurate estimate of your uncertainty with your stage frequency curve, as well as for how to do it with dams. And we'll see more with dams and RMC RFA today.